A small ship is being chased by a larger one and getting pooped at to boot. A species with which we're unfamiliar is driving, and a talking part this early, even in a language we don't understand, suggests they're important, so it's probably time for a name. The gods finally bless us with Dabo, suggested by Billy T. Riker and the Jammin' Logicians, an entry that's been around since the second wheel we ever spun. Whoever Dabo is, they know what they're doing. Their pursuer, which might be the same species based on the purple accent colours of both ships, takes a couple of knocks and is disabled. They also have a connection to Voyager of some sort, and, after bringing up an image of the ship, try to give us a call. It's received by one of the former Borgettes, Mazzotti in this case. After a little chat, Darbo asks to be put through to Janeway, though Mazzotti's height and unfamiliarity with the system instead results in her cutting the signal off. She shouldn't even be in here, something pointed out by first Tuvok and then Seven, who enters with the other Borgettes, Ramrod, Jin, and Tonic. Keeping the kids under control is proving a touch more difficult than Seven had anticipated, as Mazzotti's curiosity is stronger than her willingness to follow instructions. She's even dicking around with the console while the others discuss what to do with her, though explains that she's trying to talk to the woman who called when admonished. Seven checks and Tuvok calls, Darbo recognising his voice, though apparently not his rank. Whoever she is, she's from before he got his extra pip. We give her a proper call on the bridge, and Darbo seems to recognise all the people here. According to her, she was an ensign on Voyager, though one who died a while back, as far as everybody else is concerned. Far from being confused by people telling her she's dead, she instead gives the date it happened, though admits she's changed a bit since then. As an aside, the date she gives for her alleged death puts it between the Season 4 episodes Hunters and Prey, making it peak Herogen time. However, it also makes it over four months after Tuvok got promoted, an event she says she didn't know about. Something doesn't add up here. We invite her aboard, albeit behind a force field, to check out the story. Darbo says she was on an away mission with Kim when she was shot during a trap laid by a Herogen hunting party. That part checks out on the timeline at least, and Kim confirms it too. She did a dead and was farted into space in a big metal suppository, like how we get rid of all our corpses, only she says that wasn't quite the end of her story. She awoke on an alien ship, the Kabali, according to her, who reanimated her corpse. Not purely for altruism, but because that's how they procreate. After bringing her back, they did lots of science to her DNA to change her into what we see before as a member of the Kabali. Then they told her that her former life was over and that she was one of them now. After two years of earning their trust, she was able to nick a shuttle and scarper, spending another six months to get here. As another aside, those numbers don't add up either. It's been two years, not two and a half, and that's before you consider that we covered about 30,000 light years in shortcuts after she died. I'm calling bullshit now, though I'm not yet sure if it's with her story or the writers counting. Anywho, the doc's done some science to her and determined that there are remnants of human DNA. DNA that matches our dead ensign, to be precise. Nobody's more delighted than Kim, whose connection to her hints at being a touch more than platonic. Janeway's still cautious, because that's her job, but until we can prove otherwise, she's willing to accept the story on faith. We'll have to keep an eye out for these Kabali lads that were chasing her, but while we work on it, we're giving her back her old job in engineering. That feels a touch premature to me, but given how many times we've fucked about with dangerous artifacts right next to the warp core, I guess they're not that arsed about one potential spy. Time for a bit of side plot. Seven's brought the kids up to the mess hall for their designated enjoyment hour. Only particular kinds of enjoyment are permitted, though, and anything that falls outside of optimal parameters, such as Mazzotti discussing braided hair with Naomi, must be stamped on. As must gin and tonic when they're caught cheating at Codiscot. Ramrod declines to play in solidarity with them, and Seven's attempts to impose order against their will causes him to rebel and leave. While Seven's getting a sample of real parenting, Kim and Darbo are in her quarters, catching up after being gone for three years. By my calculations, based on the stardate mentioned in this episode, it's been two years, one month, and a handful of days, but neither of them seem to pick up on it, so we'll ignore it for now, too. Their connection may be more platonic than I thought, as mention of a dorm room suggests that they were at the academy together. I still think it's 50-50, though. A conversation about her funeral is interrupted by the doc, who's finished doing science things and calls her down to sickbay. 
These Kabali folk have filled her full of science juice, and that's changed her entire biology. There's not enough left of her original DNA to reverse the process, but he can make some changes to her appearance over time, and we begin the treatment. I'd ask how long that'll last if the science juice is in her blood, but he's the doctor, so we'll wait and see. Those aesthetic changes are all well and good, but looking like the old Darbo does not make it so. She's been looking forward to a dessert for quite some time, but Kabali taste buds don't work the same as human ones, and the result is not what she expected. Her shift in engineering doesn't quite follow the plan either. She's able to solve a problem that had been baffling the others for a while, but she solved it because Kabali have specific knowledge on the topic, and without even thinking about it, she switches to using specialised vocabulary that can't be translated. It's a win, in a way, but Balana's compliments are difficult to accept when the rest of the shift are looking at you like an anomaly. Seven wants to be relieved of her assignment as nanny to the Borgettes. Despite her best efforts to give them all the structure and discipline possible so they can be hammered into productive cogs, the kids themselves don't seem to appreciate her efforts. Chicote explains that telling kids when they need to have fun isn't going to work, not without a confectionery robot to enforce it anyway, but he still thinks she's the right choice and denies her request. Elsewhere, Paris is becoming suspicious of Kim's interest in Darbo. Given his record to date, I'm surprised he's not taken a vow of abstinence. Kim denies everything, but Paris can see that he's full of shit, probably not helped by the fact that he's off to see her now. His attempt at an impromptu date will have to wait. Darbo's in sickbay getting another human treatment, but she's already made plans for afterwards. She's having dinner with the captain, something Kim's not managed in nearly six years of being on the ship. Even reanimated corpses seem to be ahead of him in line for promotion. The meal is a bust as the replicator somehow manages to destroy it. I guess replicator rations don't permit you a mulligan if it all goes to shit. The event itself follows suit when, given permission to speak freely, Darbo asks why Janeway had selected her for the mission on which she died. Janeway's confused by the question, clearly not having given it much thought, which seems a touch odd to me. If one of my crew came back from the dead a couple of years after the fact, I'd probably read up on the circumstances in which it happened. It's a fair question, too. She wasn't the most suited to the task or away missions in general. Janeway assumes she's blaming her, which I think is on the money despite her protests, but Darbo gives a line about not blaming those who brought you death. It sounds a lot like the sort of mantra the Kabali would teach those they bring back, and perhaps realising this herself and reflecting on what that means for who she is, she leaves. She wakes from a shit dream sequence a little later and decides to piss on Kim's sleep pattern too. She shares her awful day and he shares his desire to bang her. I'd make a comment about necrophilia here, but as he's died before as well, I'm not entirely sure whether that makes neither of them guilty or both. The Borgettes are engaging in a little sculpture, and I'll give a point here for the callback to Janeway giving Seven a similar experience before. Gin and Tonic are making cubes, Ramrod's going for something a bit more complicated, and Mazzotti doesn't give a shit about the assignment at all, instead sculpting Seven. The expected punishment from Seven doesn't come when she inspects their work, confusing Ramrod. Rather than admonish her, Seven instead chooses to praise the work and tells her to continue. There's probably a joke in there somewhere about complimenting Seven's bust. No time for inappropriate jokes, though. Darbo is awake in Kim's quarters, <clears throat> and she tells him the Kabali are coming. And she's right, too. We stick on the mood lighting, but they're not here to fight. They call, and this guy here says he wants to talk to Jet Leia, who we know as Darbo. Oh, and she's his daughter. Janeway agrees to a meeting on the condition that Darbo will be the one in control of when it ends, which is a fair compromise under the circumstances. He tries to reason with her and explains that the person she was is dead, even blaming us for abandoning her body. That feels a bit rich when he refers to the same corpse as only the raw materials that made his daughter. Being referred to as the involuntary donor for someone else's existence proves a bit much, and she leaves, telling her new dad that his daughter is dead. He's undeterred and says he'll be back with some of his mates, an implied threat that somewhat takes the shine off his claim that every life is precious to them. Darbo's in the mess hall and eating some grey paste that's more agreeable to her Kabali taste buds, or whatever part of her biology that forms a comparable analogue anyway. Kim joins her and tries to cheer her up by suggesting sabotage of Tuvok's holodeck programs, but she's not interested. Conversation turns to the Kabali guy who referred to himself as her father, and Kim wonders aloud how her human father would have reacted. She doesn't know. 
In fact, she has no memory of him at all. The changes beneath the skin are more significant than we realise. They're also not willing to stay beneath the skin, as she doubles over in pain while her face has a bit of a wibble. To sick bay, where the doc tells us that the science juice in her blood has taken issue with the changes he's made. He can fight it, but that'll mean treatment at least twice a day. That's clearly not ideal, and the news is met with anger and a bit of shouting in Kabali before she apologises and leaves. We catch up with her in the ship she nicked, where Kim asks her to stop the treatments from the dog. It'll change her back, of course, but he's fine with banging aliens. It's not like she'll be the first. She's made a decision, though. This latest setback is just the last example of a long list of things that made her feel out of place. She isn't the ensign they knew. That person died. And she might get the chance to die again if the Kabali get their way. They're back and pooping at us, which is a hell of a way to prove that they consider her precious. Kabooms start happening on the bridge as Darbo and Kim arrive. She wants Janeway to call the Kabali and tell them that she's returning. Kim has a bit of a flap and is told by all concerned to shut the fuck up. It's her choice, and she's sure this is what she wants. Kim's in the teleporter room and waiting to say goodbye to Darbo, who's back to her Kabali look now. He tries to say a few words to her in her new language, but buggers it up. Fuck's sake, Kim, it was only three words, and one of those was her name. It's the thought that counts, though, and they have a quick face mash before she leaves. I wonder if that science juice she's carrying is contagious. In the mess hall, Mazati takes pity on Kim and moves in for a chat. At least she gets a hairbrush out of it. She invites him to the holodeck, something Seven has now permitted the Borgettes to do without supervision, and we leave them to fuck up one of Tuvok's holodeck programs for the lols as we fly away. Let's overlook the many evolutionary questions inherent of a species that requires the corpses of other species to procreate, like I said last time, concessions for entertainment. While I'm content to leave a question mark on the science of it, the ethics of that process are curious to me. We've seen on a few occasions where the Voyager crew have come across the remains of others and left them alone to respect their culture, though I'll grant you we've also seen times where they haven't. It raises the question of whether most species of life do much the same if they lack the necessary cultural knowledge, or is the norm to just do what you want? And what effect does the existence of a biological imperative have on that ethical question? Do the sentient apple species of Granny Smithulus V consider us barbarians because we replicate fruit and recycle its peel, pips or core, despite the ingestion of nutrients being a biological imperative for us? One person's food is another person's friend. And how much of what happened here is our own doing? We're the ones who ignorantly discarded our biological waste across the galaxy. Considering how many of those metal suppositories we've shat into the Delta Quadrant, it's hardly surprising that we'd find a species who consider them fair game. It seems reasonable for a rational culture to conclude that, if they were important to us, we'd have kept them. But the question is potentially more complicated than that, too. Perhaps the inhabitants of their local space have a custom of gifting their dead to the Kabali that they may live again. Hell, it might even be a religion. Now that I think about it, you could even argue that the custom of space burial goes against the principles of the Prime Directive. We don't know where that shit will end up. What if it crashes into the moon of a pre-warp but early space age species? Under the circumstances, the phrase take only pictures, leave only footprints would seem a wise course of action for space travel, as well as exploring nature. It's pleasing, then, that the Kabali weren't painted as the antagonist in this episode. The guy that we talk to is perfectly courteous and fair for the most part, only making threats at the prospect of losing his daughter. Kim's adamant that their actions were wrong, but his narrow-mindedness can be attributed to that same personal investment. Speaking of Kim, we're given yet another story where having a relationship with someone is being used in place of actual character growth for himself. As far as I'm concerned, this still falls under the heading of things happening to him. We learned nothing about him in this, save for the fact that he's a bit tidy obsessive and fancied someone. I'm pretty sure the former of those has been touched on previously, but frankly, nothing about Kim is interesting enough for me to remember, and that doesn't change here. We'll close, then, with a look at Seven's overbearing parenting, which I suspect is likely an overcorrection from her own shitty parents. Annika Hansen's childhood came second place to their desire for scientific research. It's possible that her obsessive timetable structuring, whilst partly a Borg order thing, was also an attempt to give the Borgettes the optimal childhood experience that she didn't get, 
whether they want it or not. Her wish to be absolved of the responsibility is likely tied to that same desire to not fail them. Incidentally, that raises a question over legality and ethics. Seven states she doesn't want to be responsible for them, and Chicote denies her wishes, but what authority does he have over that decision? If the laws of the 24th century are similar to what we have now, then a parent can't simply choose to not have responsibility for a child without formal adoption, but Seven isn't their parent. She's also not Starfleet, something we've touched on before, so can't be ordered to take on the role. In fact, she didn't want the responsibility in the first place and had to be convinced by Janeway. I would tend to agree that Janeway and Chicote are probably both right that it'll be best for the kids, and Seven's caution is likely a matter of confidence. It all turns out well enough in the end once Seven realises she needs to loosen her white knuckle grip a little, but I'm left wondering how the situation might have concluded had she flat out refused. End of episode. Okay, we won't mess with Janeway's coffee. I think that's best for the old crew, and more importantly us. I guess that means we've got to strike a balance between God in her and not sending her so far over the edge that she self-destructs the ship. Any ideas? We could change his name in the crew database. Change his name? Do you really think she'll kill him just for hacking a database? No, I think she'll kill him if we call him Tuvix. Woof.